legs, I'm clear, and um, I'm not frozen. Good evening to all of you. I bid you peace. It is 9.45 p.m., and my perception is that I am freezing. So let's see why we can't fix this. Yes, I always got stuff on worship. Worship the Pattern of Things in Heaven by Bishop Joseph Garlington. All right. Uh, it's 945. I don't want to be on here all night, uh, but let's do some talk. Hey, I um, first of all, thank you to all of my first time viewers uh, and to those of you that have already so kindly shared your periscopes. Um, thank you so much. Jeremy Fry said, hey, hey, um, listen, I um, had a lot of very important conversations today, um, but uh and I'm always very reflective at the end of the day about the things that I discuss, things that I teach, things that I talk about. Adrian Davis, I love you as well. I really do. Um, and um, one of the things, hey, Prophetess Keisha, I was talking about in my journey in ministry and my first ministry examples and my ministry traumas, uh, the people to whom I would credit my ministry development to, or some of it at least, uh, my ministry phases, seasons, self-discovery. I was talking about all of that. And one of the things that I noticed, um, and probably I had noticed that was a strength of mine, is uh, <laughs> uh, tell uh, Prophet V, I love her anyway, don't manifest, is that one of the things that has worked or had worked to my advantage, uh, particularly in the awakening phases of my call. And I think there are different phases in your call awakening being like the first one where you start realizing, okay, something is not normal with me. I'm a little different. God is doing something. I learned that I, to my advantage, one of the things I had working for me was the power of posture. The power of posture. And I, um, I hadn't really learned that or knew that I learned that but then I started thinking about all of the different influences in my journey and the, the pastors that I had had and uh, those that had been a part of my life uh, ministerially speaking at least from the time I was a, a boy up until the time I became an adult and then a husband and then a father and all of that stuff I learned that my posture was consistent even at times with wicked men and men that were unrighteous unclean um, yeah, all of that stuff. And so one of the, it sounds like a good book. Okay. I'll work on it. So, and, and I, as I looked at, I actually agree as I looked at what God has taught me, what God is doing with me, I couldn't help but notice that posture had a lot to do with it. And what I mean by that is that when I came into relationship or contact with people that I had discerned, uh, either was going to be significant in my future, uh, key in my development, or have a role to play in what I understood about myself, that I, for whatever reason, probably the Holy Spirit, understood that my posture was important to me being, being able to receive what I needed to receive. And so I often say, and I say this, I, I say this phrase as an intelligent man and somebody who is a self-proclaimed intellectual, I think that smart people are very difficult to lead. They are some of the most complicated people in the world to lead because particularly smart people that grow up in church. And here's why, you know, when you are a smart person or an intelligent person, you feed your intelligence, you grow your intelligence. Uh, what happens is you grow up in church and you end up having a lot of questions about a lot of things that you see that you end up assuming that nobody has the answers to. So you have these judgments in you about the way things should or should not be done. And th those inward lessons and stuff become the lens by which you judge people, you view things, you view experiences. And so, um, so, but posture in relationship to that point um, was a major way that a lot of my matter of facts and a lot of my con conclusions had been tempered by wisdom, by the word of God, or by different ways to see things. And in my current experience, what I'm learning now uh, is that it's almost 
Mm, this is going to be very... Pastor LeBriant friend is in here. Y'all have my back with this because Periscope may go crazy. It is almost... It's rare. I'm not going to say impossible, but it's rare to find people, leaders or otherwise, that know the power of posture. Now, I don't, I'm not saying you're at a disadvantage if you don't know it immediately, because I think you can grow and mature into knowing it. But it's very rare that you run in people who know the power of posture once you engage them and when you come into their life. It's just very, it's almost like they don't make them like they used to. It used to be that people automatically sensed and knew when a vessel, a man, a woman, a pastor carried a level of wisdom or anointing or insight or whatever that uh, could potentially take them to their next level or unlock a realm of potential in them or stir a gift in them that they would immediately assume the position. Now, I'm not talking about being a, a glorified butler or a certified water carrier or getting the briefcase award in heaven. What I'm referring to is heart posture, mental posture, not, not, not thinking on your own. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying placing value and placing weight uh, in the words, the insights, the instructions, the counsel of another to allow it to work its way into your life to work to your advantage. Posture is important. It's what got Elisha what he got. It's what got the woman with the issue of blood what she got. It's what Joshua is how Joshua got what he got. And so I'm thinking we need to go another round and teaching the people around us how to posture yourself around people that have what you need. Um, and how to deliberately posture yourself so as to not miss, not abort or not forfeit the opportunity to have something deposited or poured or invested in you that could end up taking you to the next level. And I came across a scripture today about an unteachable spirit that blessed me, that blessed me. I love the word of God. I've been a student of the Bible probably, wow, for the last 20 years of my life. And um, I'm, I never get bored with the things I learn in it. But I saw a, a scripture in the book of Proverbs Proverbs 13, 18, Proverbs 13, 18. And here's what it says. This is powerful. It says, poverty and shame shall be unto him that refuseth instruction. But whoever regards reproof shall be honored. Again, it says, poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. But he that regardeth reproof shall be un honored. What that means is that an unteachable spirit ends up bringing two undeniable things to your life. And that's poverty or levels and degrees of lack. Not just financial, but emotional lack, relational lack, character lack. It's Proverbs chapter 13 verse 18. But poverty is basically the Bible's way of expressing lack. Um, so an unteachable spirit will uh, inevitably open up your life to a form or a level of poverty because being teachable enriches you, it increases your value, it, it, it enhances your worth to the world around you. Now, I'm not talking about your worth to God, I'm talking about your worth to the world. You become worth more to the world around you based upon what you are willing to be taught, either by God or by teachers or whomever. Uh, and so, but the Bible says if you are unteachable and if you refuse instruction, that you have kind of become glued to poverty, a level of lack. But then it also says shame, shame. And that was what was intriguing to me as well. Because the Bible also says that if, you know, those that don't, um, uh, that talk about how a workman needs not be ashamed if he rightly divides the word of truth. So that scripture also compares and relates uh, not knowing how to rightly divide the word and rightly divide truth or rightly divide wisdom um, have a, has a reason to be ashamed because the Bible says a workman needs not be ashamed if they rightly divide the word of truth. So again, shame and, 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 and being teachable are related. So it makes you wonder um, if people are ashamed, if they are an embarrassment, uh, or if they have levels of lack in their life, if they have quality teachers, 
And I'm not just talking about on an academic level. I'm talking about life teachers, relationship teachers, or if they they have the right teachers and they're postured the wrong way. Because I find that you can have right teachers and be postured wrong. Or you cannot have right teachers and just kind of be customizing your route and um, making your wisdom up as you go, letting it flow only from uh, trial and error and experiences. And so um, I think we need to do some examinations of uh, who should be mentoring why you need to mentor and at what point, like I find with all of this talk about this is my mentor, that's my mentor. What I'm finding, and even with the whole spiritual parent stuff, what I'm finding is that there is a lot of pretension, pretension and a lot of presumption in it. People don't thoroughly discuss uh, a lot of it. Like number one, why should I mentor at this point in my life and in my in my stage? Is is knowing is knowing something enough to mentor or to take on the responsibility of involving myself in somebody's life? Or how will I know if I am an effective mentor? And and listen, there is a a, a global desperateness, if I could just say it that way for attention from people, whether it be for validation, security, rejection, whatever, There's this discussion is worldwide. But I think we need to start personally evaluating, am I at the point in my life where I can make um, time to make somebody a project of mine, uh, to make somebody an investment of mine, etc. The second thing is, how will I know or when will I know if what I've done has been effective? Uh, what are the markers of an effective mentor arrangement if I'm agreeing to be a mentor or I'm agreeing to be a teacher of yours in a direct sense not in an indirect sense you know I probably teach thousands indirectly that I don't know and by virtue of what I say or the principles I give are instructed to some degree uh, by what I say but what I mean is in a direct sense where we're making a commitment to meet monthly or to whatever that however you're going to do it what are going to be the margins and the markers that we're doing it effectively? What are, what's going to be the basis of of the lessons that I form? How am I going to provide on the work opportunity to display your ability to physicalize the principles that I've given you, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So there's a lot of things we've got to examine about this to make sure we're not just uh, nonchalantly and arbitrarily throwing these terms out there to explain. Uh, non-tangible relationships and interactions because we don't have accurate terms to explore them. Uh, if you're in a mentorship, there should be a mutual uh, reception of something. You know, you should be receiving something as a byproduct of it, and it, it should be updated and upkept. So these are some th thoughts that run around in my mind about this subject matter. But commonly, what I know is that people don't understand the power of a teachable spirit. And what an unteachable spirit does to somebody that is anointed as a teacher. And I'm not talking about in a fivefold ministry gift sense. I'm talking about somebody that routinely finds joy and routinely finds security in divulging information, wisdom, discerning, counsel, understanding, knowledge, information, whatever, into another person. One of the things that is almost like a repellent to a good teacher is an unteachable spirit. And it doesn't take very long to run into it shockingly you know you would think that you would need four or five or six or seven conversations to discern an unteachable spirit in a person but you almost run into it immediately because an unteachable person is going to be extremely defensive extremely protective of their principle they're going to be like guard dogs around non-negotiables in their life or in their belief or in their information or in their way to do it and it's almost like they're going to go to war to protect that stuff from your ability to alter it from your ability to speak into it uh, so so you can almost instantly run into an unteachable spirit. But the reverse is also true. When somebody is postured the right way, it's like you could be talking about politics or jeans or gym shoes and something in you is provoked to instruct, to tailor make your next sentence to this person's season and where they're going. Now, the Bible also says... That in Proverbs 9, 9, if you give instruction to a wise man, he will become wiser. 
If you give instruction to a wise man, he will become wiser. But it says if you teach a just man, he's going to increase in learning. So one of the fruit of a teachable spirit is you become the quality of your life, the quality of your gift, the quality of your decision making, the quality of your character all undergoes upgrade. It all undergoes rehabilitation, renovation, and it becomes more quality, more reliable, more sturdy, more stable, more stronger. There is a depth to what you have to offer. So I don't know if this is advice or if this is a teaching, but I just want you thinking into whether or not you are as teachable as you need to be for to match the you, the desire that you have for where you want to go. You should have a, a teachability review. Am I as teachable as the trajectory I want. Like your teachability level should match what you see about your future. It should match where you believe that you're going. But I want to also say it should match your the level of impact that you think that you want to get. And so this is very, very, very important. You've got to deliberately learn how to posture yourself under and around the information that uh, is able to change your life and to change your world. Um, Job 4, 6, how forceful are right words. Right words carry a force, a power, an impact. Something that has the ability to break into things, your world, your mentality. Sometimes it can come to you from a person about how to see yourself, how to change your brain. crisis, how to be a better husband or a, 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 a better wife or a better, how to deal with family choice. So, you know, you really need to review if the deficiency that you may be experiencing in your life for a mentor or a teacher or any of that, if it's really in part due to your inability to be taught, if you are a teachable person and uh, if you do your best to consistently I get people, I'll meet them around the world, they say, hey, I'm very, 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 very teachable. But then if you give them a test and you give them a lesson or you talk to them about something, you give them counsel and there be no follow up, it's going to make any quality teacher reconsider if you're teachable. Because a part of being teachable is taking responsibility for what you were taught and bringing home. But being open and being receptive is not the same as being teachable. Just because you're open and just because you're receptive does not mean that you've taken information and committed to it and made it work for you. So, you know, that's something you really want to think about. Maybe what you mean when you tell people you're teachable is I'm open. I am ready to hear, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're teachable. Uh, yes, Triv just said my next statement right here. Uh, and then posture is not just about information. It's also about honor. And there is a way um, to honor people uh, and to make a deliberate choice. Now, we're not talking about sin, unrighteousness, wickedness, witchcraft, control, dirt, filth, any of that. I'm talking about imperfections, flaws, irritants, and people's personalities. What I want us to do is, is stop building personality cults in churches. We get so glued to people's and pastors and musicians and preachers' personality that we're thrown off when they show something that is a bit uh, different than what we had hoped and different from what we are like. I learned very, very, very early in the leaders that God calls to come in my life that I was not supposed to drink from their personality. I didn't need it. I had one of my own. So nobody cared about personality stuff. What I cared about was power, wisdom, principles, the anointing, mantles, instruction, rebuke, correction, affirmation. Those are the things that mattered to me. I don't really care if how you text back or I don't really care about, you know, your whatever, the, the day of the week you're most tired. All of those are personality variables and, and frankly, don't have a real effect on my destiny. Mm -mm. I am really tapped into what I need for my journey. So, yeah, I don't really care. So, you know, when you're distracted by the personality of a person, it's going to be very difficult for you to honor it because their personality is distracting you. But you've got to honor people for what God put in them and what God made them to be and not necessarily uh, what you think or not about their personality. Because, you know, 
I guess you can have things in your personality that can be sinful, but personality is personality. And I think we get really distracted by style and really distracted by things that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And we use what we perceive about people's personality to justify why we're not teachable. Or she talks too hard or she talks too loud or or he's too strong or he could have said that a different way or why we got, you know, all of those things are non-negotiables. And what happens is when you get through voting off of how a person should be able to be in your opinion, then at the end of the day, you have missed out on stuff that frankly you need, which is why you're where you are and they're where they are. And you've missed out because of a personality thing. So it's time for you to mature and learn the power of posture and realize what you're going without and what you're opening up your life to, which the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 18, poverty and shame. It comes with not being teachable. So here's my challenge to you. Become more teachable. If I am around an authority, like if I had 40 minutes with Billy Graham, this is an example. I could care less if he didn't make direct eye contact or if he picked up his phone to text back on it or if he looked up. I would not be in his presence discouraged because he didn't give me the body language I wanted. I would just be concerned about whether or not he was going to answer my questions because I'm teachable and I learned, I know the power of posture. So, you know, when you t pick up your phone and do all that, just please give me what I need to know so that I can grow from your achievements and your championships and your realm of mastery. When a person has a realm of mastery, and not that they've, they're growing, you don't get distracted by the stuff that's in the, the personality because it doesn't matter. We all have weirdisms and we all have things that somebody's going to think is weird. But learn how to pull and learn how to make an honorable demand on the content that are in the teachers that the Lord is revealing to you and sending to your life. They're coming to you if, you if you're going somewhere. They're coming. Don't despise them. Don't overlook them. Don't ignore them because they're not packaged how you want them to be or how you had hoped they would be. If I got around Billy Graham, I'm like, hey, bro, how'd you do it? How'd you love your wife this long? How'd you stay out of scandal? How'd you, what is some wisdoms about, you know, loving? I would be all up on that. And he could say it while he cooking. He could say it while he ironing. He could say it while he was uh, uh, cleaning the, uh, the, 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 I wouldn't care. <laughs> Cause I'm not there for attention. I'm there for wisdom. When you get distracted by the personality, it may mean you're an attention seeker and not necessarily a student. So you got to learn the difference. And, you know, be there and, and get there. You know, I wish to God that I would have been as fortunate um, uh, to, to be around or to know somebody that knew Oral Roberts so he could put that big old Cherokee Indian hand on my head and he could have a glass of water in the other one or a cell phone in the other one. I don't care. <laughs> Bruh. You know, so, and, and here's the thing you need to know about personality. When you allow somebody's personality to affect your posture, it really proves your immaturity. Um, because when you look at and are distracted by people's personalities, what you assume is all of their personality is a personal choice of theirs. And some of it may be, but some people, God gives them the personalities or he makes them a certain way for their assignment, you know? So based upon where God knows a person is going in him, what he wants them to do for him, and the type of audience they're gonna face, maybe their personality may need some refinement, but a lot of the stuff that is distracting you is put there by God. There's a lot of people that are like, you too brash, you say stuff too harsh. Well, the thing is, is, when I said yes to God, I signed up to a lifetime of service around monkeys, wolves, snakes, lions, and beasts. I can't be a soft-spoken, indirect Christian coward. I've got to be brutal and blunt for the world God has called me to serve in. I mean, I'm called to, 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 to every major area that is the recipient of the gift that I have is governed by corruption. You can't go in corruption talking about mm, mm, mm. no no so i'm made for my assignment now certainly the way i'm made affects certain people which is why i i mean 
I sympathize with you, but I don't spend a lot of time being distracted about who my personality affects. I really don't care. But you've got to be concerned about what you need to be concerned about and not distracted about your preferences for a person's personality. You no, know, what matters is the mastery. And when you see what a person has mastered, you just got to become more teachable and demonstrate your value for what the teacher offers into your world, you know. Some of the some of the greatest decisions I've made in my life, my decision um, to get engaged to my wife, I was thinking about it. I, I, true story. Camila and I started dating in January. I think we're engaged by April. So somewhere around February, I already had the ring. I was decided. I was sick of being single. I was done playing games with these church women and the other kind as well. And um, so I was on a plane with my spiritual dad and we were going to Ohio. He had called me uh, to prophesy at an event and uh, he wanted me to travel with him to minister to people and prophesy. So I was on a plane and uh, I was sitting next to him talking to him about me and Camila. And uh, I started telling him what my conflicts was about presenting the information. And he looked at me in a very regular personality and said, hey man, give her that ring, go ahead and cover it. You're a pastor, you have no business being engaged for years. You need to go ahead, if you decide it, put some closure on it so that women won't continue to throw themselves at you and so that you can uh, protect your character from accusation, engage that woman now. And I was like, okay, I got off that plane. That had to have been a Saturday that I talked to my spiritual dad and Sunday, this black man was engaged. I took her. I took her in front of my church because I was single. I took her in front of my church uh, and that I pastored, and I got on my knees and I asked her to marry me in front of my whole elders staff and my whole elders board. That came not from a meeting, not from a crisis, not from a breakdown. I didn't call my spiritual father and say, "Will you go behind the veil?" We was on the plane. I was drinking pop. <laughs> And he looked at me and, and I received it as wisdom and I did what I needed to do. I was teachable. I bore fruit from what I was taught. So just an example, you know, you, you draw, learn how to draw, learn how to pull. And sometimes when you have a teacher, you've got to consistently present yourself as being teachable so that they don't assume you don't need to know something. Sometimes when you are a smart person or even when you're more mature, a teacher may assume that you have the knowledge and the information. Not every teacher looks for what they can pour. Some of it will look at you and assume that you're okay or assume that you know everything you need to know. So sometimes you just gotta give them like, gentle reminders by your posture that I need to know something. I would love to uh, pick your brain on this or ask you the right questions. So yeah, it's called a lunch and learn, man. You wanna know something? Take them to lunch and learn. And then after you learn, that doesn't mean you were teachable. It's what you do with what you were taught that defines your level of teachability and or not. So that's important for you to realize. Many people are not as teachable as they think. Some of them just have flattery. Some of them are uh, open and, and uh, some of them are just uh, receptive, but that doesn't necessarily make them teachable. So... Yeah, I just wanted to release that that was on my heart. But consider Proverbs thirteen eighteen. If you if you reject teaching and you don't cultivate a teachable spirit, then you've opened your life to poverty and shame. Isn't it nice to know? <laughs> hey, I love you guys, and uh, it's a great day indeed, Elder Ivy. Anything for you, sweetheart. Uh, anything, Isaac. I love you. I love you. My woman just walked in. Got to go give her some attention. And, um, <laughs> but I'm out of here. <laughs> got a couple of things I got to teach her tonight. So, uh, <laughs> let me get up out of here. <laughs> and, uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. God bless you. And, um, I'll see you in the morning. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>